walk by this grave and the courage of it takes over the grave and just decompose it because you hear the song going backwards. Yeah, that would be more like a walk by. Good morning, you brave souls. <laughs> so I welcome uh, everyone in person and online and on YouTube, on our Facebook page and on Rogers Cable TV. So you can find us in a number of places. We use screens for our services. And so to assist each of us in following along during the service, the text in red is for the leader of the service. That's me today. And the text in bold black is for all of us to read together. So please join me in the acknowledgement of the land on which we worship. As we gather for worship, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territory of First Nations peoples. Peoples who have lived on this land and by these waters for thousands of years. We, we gather as a non-Indigenous community of faith on the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, giving gratitude for their stewardship through the ages. We are newcomers to this land, and we have gained so much in coming. Our gain, however, has come at a great cost to First Nations people. We acknowledge that we have gained much within racist systems of our creation, systems which have benefited those who are white, Christian, and heterosexual. Our acknowledgement is only the beginning of our journey toward reconciliation, toward healing of all our relations with those we have belittled in this culture. Our words must now be followed up with action. We pray, we pray the Holy Spirit, Spirit breathes forgiveness, forgiveness, hope, and love into our relations and sets us free from the evil of colonialism. So a couple of announcements. First of all, the frozen soup sale is today, so don't forget to, to check out the selection of frozen soups at the soup sale following today's service. And the sale is by donation, and the freezer is full. 
So we'll probably be offering this again next week. So um, if you weren't able to come today, then come next week and, uh, and see what um, the people here left for you. Our Christmas hamper gift card program is now accepting donations. And so uh, look at the online announcement for more details on how to uh, participate in this. Now, we're meeting as a congregation to consider the 2023 budget and it'll take place on December the 11th, shortly after the worship service. So uh, please plan on participating in person or via Zoom meeting platform. All members and adherents are encouraged to attend. Those who will be online, you'll get a few minutes to go and get a coffee um, before we, I switch you over from a webinar to a meeting so that we can see and hear you. Stewardship packages went out, but if you didn't get one and you would like one, there's some at the back, or you can phone the office and we will send you one. So the photo directory update. I know that there was a, um, some people that stopped in the office last week and said, is it ready? Where is it? Can I get it? Um, not yet, uh, but they would be soon. So anyone that got their picture taken gets a free copy. And those who didn't get their picture taken, um, you can order one at the cost of $20. So uh, contact Melinda Smeagle and her number's there, but it'll also be in our online announcements. So um, if you didn't get your picture and you want to know who else is in the congregation, um, that's a good way. Uh, there's, today is white gift. And I'd like to announce basically because of the weather, um, we're not taking the white gifts up to Cape Croker until Saturday of next week. So if you missed it because the weather wouldn't allow you to get out or you forgot, um, know that you can still drop them off at the church during uh, office hours. So Tuesday to Friday, 1.30 to 5, we will still be accepting white gifts. So as the church has done and greeted one another over the millennium, Christ be with you. So I would invite you to share that peace with those around you in any manner that you find comfortable. So you can wave, give the peace sign, namaste, or, you know, just grin. <laughs> so let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to embrace God's presence in our worship. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and so we light this candle. The Christ candle. To signify Jesus in our world and in our worship. Thanks be to God. And join me in our call to worship. Jesus calls us to open our hearts to all in need. We come this day to hear his words of encouragement for us. Look around you. Take a moment. Look around you. Smile at each other. Even though you're wearing masks, know that your eyes are lighting up because you're smiling. For we all have need, that we have need of friendship and of welcome. 
With God's great love in our hearts, we find our welcome in this place of worship. Amen. And our prayer of approach is also responsive. Let us pray. With thankful hearts, we pause this day to be reminded of our grandest hope, that the calamities, the demands, even the blessings of this world do not have the last word. You are the one who was and is and who is yet to come, a ruler of a different kind. Open our hearts to the comfort, the challenge, and the mystery of this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, your faithful witness, we pray. Amen. So now it's time to dance. We're going to sing and make a joyful noise, and I want to see wiggling and dancing, yes, smiling. I did see some. God promises us grace and forgiveness. God gives us light. We are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us join in the prayer of confession. God of all creation, you have asked us to reach out to feed the hungry give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those imprisoned, welcome the stranger. These words are not unfamiliar to us, yet somehow we have treated them as nice words, but not an active part of our life of faith. Forgive us, Lord, for the meagerness of our faith, 
and the weakness of our witness. Amen. So, number eight teaching of the survivor flag. You only have one more after this one. So the survivor flag is an expression of remembrance meant to honor residential school survivors and all the lives and communities impacted by the residential school system in Canada. Each element depicted on the flag was carefully selected by survivors from across Canada who were consulted in the flag's creation. And as you know, here is what it looks like after that careful consul consultation. So we learned about the family depicted on the flag. Some saw the adults as our ancestors watching over us. Others saw these as parents signifying whole families ripped apart and also reuniting to represent healing. And we learned about the children depicted on the flag. More than one child is depicted in the design as often whole sibling groups were taken from their parents, from their younger siblings, from grandparents, and, and from their community. And we learned then about the seeds below ground depicted on the flag. It represented the spirits of the children who never returned home. Although they have always been present, they are now seen and searched for. And then we learned about the tree of peace depicted on the flag. Had a Shinomi symbol of how nations were united and brought to peace, which in turn provided protection, comfort, and renewal. And then we learned about the cedar branch depicted on the flag. It was sacred medicine that represents protection and healing but it is also what is used by some indigenous cultures when one enters the physical world and then again when they pass on to the next. The seven branches acknowledges the seven sacred teachings taught in many indigenous cultures. And we learned about the cosmic symbolism depicted on the flag. It represents the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets in that circle. The sun represents the divine protection that ensure those who survived came home. The North Star is prominent as it is an important navigation guide for many indigenous cultures. And then we learned about the Métis sash depicted on the flag. The sash is a prominent ceremonial regalia worn with pride. Certain colors of thread represent lives that were lost, while others signal connectedness as humans and resilience through trauma. All the threads woven together spell out part of the history, but no single thread defines the whole story. And this week, we learn about the eagle feather that's depicted on the flag, right in the middle of that circle. The eagle feather represents that the creator's spirit is among us, much as the Christ candle. It's depicted pointing upwards, which mirrors how it is held when one speaks their truth. From Phyllis Gugu, Micmac survivor who attended Shabanaki Residential School. In our culture, she says, the eagle was given the responsibility of carrying our prayers from the physical to the spiritual realm where the creator and our ancestors reside. When we hold an eagle feather, she says, it causes the creator to take notice. The eagle feather is often depicted, depicted pointing downward. But here it points upward, as it is often did when survivors held it to speak their truth during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We hope that through these sacred teachings, 
from the survivor flags that we will gain understanding of our indigenous relatives. Our first Bible reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 to 14 from the message. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It is strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy, thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. God rescued us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the son he loves so much, the son who got us out of the pit that we were in, got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. Let's join together in singing Rejoice, the Lord is King, number 213 in Voices United. Our second Bible reading is from Luke chapter 23, verses 13 to 43 from the New Revised Standard Version, the updated edition. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing, and they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this 
is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? As we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you are, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Redeemer. Amen. So the Feast of Christ the King was and is basically a language thing, a symbol, a metaphor designed to be a statement of life's fundamental question. Who rules our lives? Who dominates our culture? We are asked to remember, especially today, that Jesus is our King. And shouldn't we honor our Lord and King all the time, not just on special times like this Sunday? Think of the crucifixion of Christ for a moment. The, the passage that I read from Luke a few minutes ago. Just about everyone, everyone there, from the guards to the Pharisees, to the thief on the cross next to him, taunted Jesus saying, if you're the Messiah, if you are the king, then save yourself, and while you're at it, save us. Deborah Mumford explains that those at the crucifixion must have been perplexed to witness someone known by others as the king of the Jews, to be hanging on a cross and to be crucified. First of all, Roman crucifixion was only used on people of the lower classes and those who were not Roman citizens. People of the higher classes were not treated as severely and certainly not reprimanded or punished publicly. So if Jesus was true royalty, he would not have been crucified on the cross. Secondly, even if Jesus somehow ended up on the cross, as a person with authority in those days, he would have had power and influence to secure his own deliverance. So they likely mocked Jesus because it was obvious to them that Jesus could not have been the person some claimed him to be. It just wasn't possible. It's pretty obvious from the gospel story that actually none of the people mentioned recognized Jesus for who he was. And this, it seemed, meant to them that they could abuse him as they might abuse any convicted criminal. To them, nothing special was going on. It was business as usual, business without thinking, business without considering what it was that God would want them to do, whether or not this man on the cross was the Messiah or a misguided fool. If only they had known, they might have behaved differently. 
Now, I don't know if I've told this story before, but there is a story about the head of a monastery who went to visit a well-known, respected guru. What is it you seek? asked the guru. And the abbot recounted a tale of woe. It's a familiar tale. At one time, his monastery had been famous throughout the Western world. Its cells were filled and its church had resounded to the chant of the monks. But hard times had come to the monastery. People no longer flocked there to nourish their spirits. And the church was almost silent. There were only a handful of monks left and these went about their duties with heavy hearts. Now this is what the abbot wanted to know. Is it because of some sin of ours that the monastery has been reduced to this state? Yes, replied the girl. And what might that sin be, asked the abbot. And the guru replied, a sin of ignorance. The guru went on to tell the abbot that one of your number is the Messiah in disguise, and you are ignorant of this. Throughout the long journey back to his monastery, the abbot's heart beat fast as he thought that the Messiah, the Messiah himself, has returned to earth and is right there in his monastery. How was it that he failed to recognize him? And who could it be? Who could it be? Father Cook? Brother Sankratin? Brother Treasurer? Brother Pryor? Uh, no, not him. He had too many defects. <laughs> but then the guru had said he was in disguise. Could those defects be part of his disguise? Well, come to think of it, everybody in the monastery had defects, and one of them had to be the Messiah. The guru said so. So back in the monastery, the abbot assembled all the monks, and he told them what he had discovered. They looked at each other in disbelief. The Messiah? Here? Incredible! But he was supposed to be here in disguise, so, well, maybe. One thing was certain. If the Messiah was there in disguise, it's not like that they would recognize him, just as in today's scripture, they did not recognize him. But they, the monks reacted differently than those in the scripture. <laughs> they took to treating everyone with special respect and consideration. You never know, they said to themselves when they dealt with one another. Maybe this is the one. The result was that the atmosphere in the monastery became vibrant. And once again, the church echoed with holy and joyful chants of monks who were aglow with the spirit of love. Jesus, our Messiah, our King, is here today. Somewhere in this church, somewhere in this community, we owe him our praise, our obedience, our special honor and care in each moment of every day as we meet him as we go about our normal business. Jesus provides us with an image of royalty totally different from the world's image of royalty. There's a story of a little boy who wanted to do something good. It il illustrates the nature of Christ's kingship, of Jesus' example to us. So six-year-old Brandon decided one Saturday morning to fix his parents' pancakes. He found a big bowl and a spoon, pulled a chair to the counter, opened the cupboard, and pulled out the heavy flour canister, <laughs> spilling it on the floor. He scooped some of the flour into the bowl with his hands, mixed in a cup of milk, and added some sugar and an egg. 
leaving a flowery trail on the floor, which by now had a few tracks through it left by his kitten. Brandon was covered with flour and getting frustrated. He wanted this to be something very good for mom and dad, but it was getting very bad. He didn't know what to do next, whether to put it all in the oven or, or on the stove. The problem was he didn't know how the oven or the stove worked. Suddenly he saw his kitten licking the bowl of mix and he reached to push her away, knocking the egg carton on the floor. Frantically, he tried to clean up his monumental mess, but he slipped on the eggs and landed on the floor, getting his pajamas all white and sticky. Just imagine. Just then, he saw Dad standing at the door. Big tears welled up in Brandon's eyes. All he wanted to do was to make something good. But he'd made a terrible mess. He was sure a scolding was coming, or even a spanking. But his father just watched him. Walking through the mess, his father picked up Brandon and hugged him, getting his own pajamas white and sticky in the process of loving him. That's how God, our Lord and King, deals with us and the messes that we create. That's how Jesus, our Lord and King, deals with us and the messes we have created. He enters into our reality and takes our messes onto himself. And that is how we are to treat each other, take on each other's messes and treat them as if they are the Messiah in disguise, because they are. Amen. Now I got reminded today to use the railing. and not go too close to the speaker because then it squeaks. So if you're at home and you don't have your uh, juice and crackers or coffee and, or juice, coffee and bread or whatever you have gotten together for communion, please take a moment and gather it up. And those here, you can get your little, um, what do you call these things? Juice and crackers in your hand, ready to go. If you don't have one, there's still some at the back. Um, and I see a couple of people coming down from the balcony, so. So let us join together in the sacrament of communion. The Spirit of God be with you and also with you. Turn to God, the source of life. We lift our hearts in prayer. Let us give thanks. We offer our joyful thanks to God. Loving God, you made this wonderful world for us to enjoy. You showed our ancestors how to care for one another. You gave us Jesus to be our friend and to bring us closer to you. He died on a cross, but you brought him to life to live with us forever. You send us your spirit and bring us to this table so that we can share your love. For all your goodness, we give you thanks, and together we give you praise. Lord of lords, creator of all things, nature gives thanks to your, your creatures give thanks. Your praise rises in us like the great river, God of all things, creator, provider. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us remember together that vision of God's reign shown to us in Jesus at the table. He shared food with followers and friends, with saints and sinners, 
with crowds of thousands on the hillside and a few friends in an upper room. On the night before he died, he had supper with his companions. He took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Through this loaf and this cup, Jesus lives within us. In word and in deed, Jesus lives among us. And we missed one part on the slide, so I will do that right now. Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he passed it amongst them, saying, Drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. Through this loaf and this cup, Jesus lives within us in word and in deed. Jesus lives among us. Let us pray. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith as we break bread and share the cup, giving thanks for your love in Jesus the Christ. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service on behalf of all people. This we remember, this we believe. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Holy God, pour your spirit on us that we may know Christ in the breaking of bread and that in word and deed, we may be channels of your love, peace and justice in the world. Help us to love as Christ loved, knowing our own weakness, May we stand with all who stumble, sharing in his suffering. May we remember all who suffer, held in his love. May we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. And let us pray together. God within us, God beyond us, God among us. May the mystery always be named and known among all peoples and in all times. May creation give way to the rule of love and the power of life. Satisfy our hunger, granting us a hunger to see the whole world fed. Restore us to right relationship with you, with creation, with others, with ourselves. Strengthen us to reject all that would lead us away from you. Come to us when we choose death over life. Give us courage to follow your call in this moment. For in your love we find the only power, the only home, the only honor we will ever need in this life and in the life to come. This is an open table, open to everyone. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So if you're worshiping at home, please take the bread and the beverage or the crackers and whatever you have prepared and partake. If you're here in person, now is the time of testing. Can you find the little cracker on the top? And the juice on the bottom. As you partake, remember the way of Jesus as our own path of becoming. And when we leave the sanctuary, I invite you to take your little empty cups and put them in the garbage at the back.
Let us pray our post-communion prayer. O oh God, grant that we, being made your children, may daily be renewed by your Holy Spirit. Grant us, we pray, that as we have known the mystery of your light upon earth, so may we also reflect that light to a darkened world, now and forever. Amen. I have to wait because Jim's up there by himself pushing men, a multitude of buttons. So, It's through the many gifts that God has given to us that we have been given an example about giving. In Jesus the Christ, he has demonstrated compassion. We want to make a difference in our community, to see needs met and people helped. It is through the offerings that we have put on the plates at the back of the church or the offerings that we have given by PAR or those by e-transfer or those by legacy giving or the offerings we have made with frozen soup or the gifts we have gathered to share with Cape Croker knowing that they won't go up to Cape Croker till Saturday so if you still want to, del uh, to, to bring some in the office is open between 1.30 and 5 on Tuesday to Friday, and we will still accept gifts. But also those offerings that we gather on our grocery cart at the end of the month to give to the food bank, or even the gifts of ourselves in time and talent, 
It is through our sharing that we can serve the community in which we live. And we pray in the name of Jesus, the greatest gift ever given. Let us say together the prayer of dedication for all these offerings. With gratitude for all the blessings you have poured into our lives, Lord Jesus, we come bringing these our white gifts, that they may be used in service to those in need. Bless these gifts and those who have given them, that they may truly be a blessing in your holy name. Amen. So we're now going to join together and sing you Servants of God, Voices United, number 342. Go out into the world proclaiming that Christ is King. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you.